1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll begin reading together in verse 1. This is the word of God. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of, the, of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as, you, as we told you beforehand, and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is the word of God. And so as we come to chapter 4 in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, we've been working our way through this letter together. Throughout the last several weeks, we've really seen Paul's love for these young believers. He described earlier that he's sort of like a spiritual father, loving them, rejoicing over, and delighting in his spiritual children. And in this chapter, the Apostle Paul is almost like the father giving instructions to their child as they're moving out of the house or heading out to go to college for the first time, here's the talk that he's giving to them. And the Apostle Paul turns to particular areas of need within the church, and like any true preacher, or like any true parent, he opens by saying, finally, but he has a lot more to say. <laughs> he's got two more chapters of, of instruction to give them, and he starts with, practical areas of concern that they need to work on, and, and then he's going to turn to look at theological areas that need correction. And, but he begins by saying two things. He starts by saying, hey, what we have taught you has come from Jesus himself. And to say, second, that they were thriving in their faith. He, he's basically telling them, hey, keep up the good work, kid. Look, look what he says, verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us how you ought to walk and please God just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. He says, continue to walk as you are walking and serving God as you are. They were pleasing God. And we don't, we don't hear this enough. So many people... They, they think of God as a heavenly father who is always upset with them. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You are walking in such a way that God is actually pleased with you. That through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, we can actually please God. In fact, he goes on to say, not only can they please God, they can actually do the will of God. Look at verse 3, the very start of it. He says, for this is the will of God. Lots of us talk about the will of God, don't we? Even non-Christians often desire to know and do God's will. And the topic of God's will really is one of the most core and important things anyone could think about. In fact, I decided to, to do an illustration today. I don't just bring totes here to church very often, right? 
And I wanted us to think about God's will in two senses here. This will be fun. I've never done this. I've been front of people before, so we'll see how this goes, right? So, there's two different ways in which we can talk about God's will, two totes that we have to put questions in. There's first, and hopefully this will be up on the screen too, is God's secret will. That's the first sense in which we can talk about God's will, is God's secret will. That there are things in your life that God isn't going to tell you. That there's things in your life that will be unknown to you. They're known to God, but they're secret ultimately to you. And then second, there is God's revealed will. It's what God has told us. God has not left us completely in the dark. You can go throughout the Bible to find both of these, but they actually converge together in Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. Let me show you this verse. I love this. Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. Look at this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that have been revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So notice, there are secret things, things God is not going to reveal to us and tell us right away. But then there are things God has revealed, and those are the things that we are to do, they belong to us. We are to be responsible for. So let's go to the boxes with a few questions that people might ask. First, you might wonder, is God's will that they ever get done with, work, with road work on I-24? <laughs> Friends, that's God's secret will. <laughs> Only he knows, right? When in the world will they finally have that pizza place built and ready across the street on 68? God's secret will. Friends, right? And when, and maybe you wake up and go, man, I really want a sweet treat. Is McDonald's ice cream machine going to work today? There's God's secret will, right? God, God hasn't told us that belongs to the Lord. And this is important because we have to recognize there are things in life that we're not going to understand. We don't get access to everything the king of the universe does and why he does it. He, he does offer us in his words some explanations and reasons, but he doesn't always apply those to the particular circumstances that we're in. So the Holy Spirit is telling us to be careful not to stew on the secret, but to commit to God's commands. To be careful that we're not so concerned about things bigger than us, that we forsake the simple things that God has given to us, to give ourselves to obedience to Jesus as a child. Because he doesn't leave us completely in the dark, right? God does reveal things to us. He reveals things in creation, right? And, and the fact that we're created a certain way, he's, he's put limitations around us. This is very unpopular in our day, but regardless of how somebody might feel, how God has made us to be is how we are to be, right? There's limitations he's put on us. You can believe you're a bird all you want, but if you go jump off this building, you're going to fall, right? He hasn't given us wings to go fly, but not only does he reveal things in creation, he's revealed things for us in his word. And in fact, that's Paul's whole point he's wanting to give to us, that what he had taught the Thessalonians, what they had received these teachings, were God's revealed will, God's will for their life. And so, go back to verse 3, where he tells us, what exactly in the big picture is God's revealed will for your life? Verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Friends, that's a churchy word, isn't it? That's the Bible's way of speaking about holiness, godliness. Your Christ likeness. So, in the big picture, what does God want from you? What does He reveal for you in your life? God's will is that we walk in holiness, godliness, and Christ likeness. That's what God wills, big picture, for your life. That we walk according to His commands, that we live according to His good design. God's will is that we experience life as He created it experiences pleasure, and to walk in true life. And so, 
while there's things that God hasn't revealed for us to know, they're secret, they're known only to him, God hasn't completely left us in the dark as to how we're going to live here in this world. He's revealed his will to us for all kinds of things. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul wants to give us God's will for three areas of our lives. Let's start first. That in 1 Thessalonians 4, we see God's will for your sexuality. You know, uncontroversial, light, fluffy stuff for Paul to get started with, right? Paul's out to get canceled today, right? Here's verse 3. Look what he says. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. God's will is that we walk in sexual purity. And Paul even defines that for us here. The Greek word he uses here is the Greek word porneia, and that's a root where we get another English word you might be familiar with. And this word was very familiar to his audience. They would have known exactly what this meant. That it would include any Heat 
or passionate. What might feel good for a moment, friends, will feel gross in days to come. But the passage takes another turn. Look at verse 6. Look at this. He says, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Here's the second thing we see. Why does God care about this? He cares about your honor, and God cares about injustice. God cares about injustice. Friends, God cares about your sexuality because he cares about when people wrong you and sin against you. It says the Lord is an avenger of those who have been used, abused, manipulated, or, or, or anybody who has selfishly taken something that isn't theirs. This is a solemn warning. Be careful when you put your hands on God's sons and daughters. God will avenge, and God is watching. Think about it this way. Many dads will warn the young guy who takes their daughter out on a date, and they'll sit there. They'll look all stern, and they'll have the gun sitting there on the couch. Let me tell you something. There's far more. There's things far scarier than dad sitting on the couch with the gun. God is watching. The heavenly Father is watching, and He will avenge. It, it tells us to those who have been wronged. Here's some consolation: that the Judge of all the earth will do what is right. It may not come in this life, but it will come. And there's others of us that need to hear that God is an avenger, yes, but others need to hear that God is able to heal and forgive and to cleanse those who feel guilt or hurt or broken over their past. That what has happened to you isn't the end of your story and it isn't who you are. He's able to transform you and to give you a new calling. And this is where Paul turns, verse 7. He says that God cares about your calling. That God cares about your calling. Look at verse 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. That when God called you to himself, he calls you not toward impurity or uncleanliness, but toward holiness and honor and purity. See, the, the struggle in our culture today is that people, people in our culture believe that sex is everything. It's funny because both the super traditional and the, and the super progressive both seem to believe that, that, that the things that you have done or do sexually, that's who you are at the core of who you are. And yet God defines his people by his calling, not by what you've done. That's the beauty of grace, that God defines you, and if you are his, if he has saved you, he gets to say who you are. He gets to say what your calling is, and he gets to say... What, what, what the legacy of your life will be. Notice what Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at what Paul says here. For do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And here's the good news, verse 11, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Friends, aren't you thankful Amen. for the past tense? Such were some of you. If God gets a hold of your life, whatever has happened to you and whatever you have done, he can turn and redeem and transform. What seems dead, God brings to life. Whatever wound is on your life, bring it to the one with wounded hands, and he will lead you and call you toward greater life and greater hope. But Paul has, has another flip side to all of this. He wants to speak a word to those who, who might disagree with him about some of this. Those who go, well, that, that, that's great, Paul, but what do you know? The Thessalonians were much like our culture today. They were in a city that was very perverse, very free. They could have had anything that they wanted. They were in the New York of their day. And friends, the ancient world is, 
It's much like today, they just didn't have the internet to access anything they wanted, the touch of their hands. Friends, there's a temptation here for us to just go with the culture because it's so much easier to think, well, well Paul's just a hater or small-minded, or, or just another damaging part of, of, of purity culture. And you know, it's, it's popular in our day to, to criticize, like, purity culture. And there certainly are some, some things that we can criticize from that, what, what churches that have, have done in 80s, 90s, and now. But, friends, sexual purity is to, as an act of Christian obedience is not a new thing. It didn't start when some guy in the 80s wrote a book about it. It goes all the way back to the first century, even to the words of Jesus. And look what Paul says is the core danger for us here. Look at verse 8. Look what he says. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. He says, friends, See that, yes, there are dangers in some of the, the legalism that we can see in some of purity culture. But, friends, there are real dangers in impurity culture. That this is not a minor issue. To disregard what God says about sex, Paul says, is to disregard himself. Because if God is a God over our bodies, or over something as important as sex, then what is he God over? So when Paul's saying all this, let's go to the boxes. Let's go to the boxes. So there's oftentimes people will think, well, maybe God secretly wants me to do something that his word tells me not to. Or maybe I am the exception to what Paul has to say. Let me tell you something. This box and this box never disagree. So let's say, single folks, does God reveal who you're going to marry in, your, in the word? Like you're just reading through and you're like, man... I'm reading about Abraham today. I need to go find somebody named Abraham and get hitched. God doesn't tell you that. Please don't, don't give that a shot, right? Don't go, don't go to that. That's part of God's secret will. But God does give you a few things to focus on as you search for a spouse, doesn't he? Along the way, is it God's will for you to hook up with that guy or girl that you're not married to? God's revealed will would say no, right? So that's what... God's secret will says as well. Even if the culture says it or, 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 or the people around you might pressure you into friends, God has said no. Or let's, let's, let's stop picking on the single folks. Think a little bit about the married folks. Friends, hear this. Is it God's will for you to be with somebody other than your spouse? No. There's so many people that may think, well, maybe God's secretly will that I be with somebody else. Friends, that's, that's dangerous thinking that they're beginning to step into there. Because, friends, there, his seat, what, he, what, he has, what he has said and not shared, what he has shared, never disagree. It's something that we aren't even to consider. And finally, is it God's will that we go with the culture that says it's good, anything's good with anybody? Well, no. God's revealed will would say, no, we don't. That's a disregard what God has said. But sex and sexual purity is to disregard God himself. God's will is that we walk in purity because God cares about our honor. He cares about the injustice done to us. And he cares about the calling put on our lives. But God does care about more than just sexual purity. Paul continues, doesn't he? And he highlights God's will for your love. God's will for your love. Look at verse 9. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. He speaks about brotherly love, Philadelphia, right? The sort of the city of brotherly love, to love one another. This was something that the Thessalonians had, were excelling in. And yet he said, I, still, I don't have a, a huge need to go on and on about this. But he says that while most of us would agree that it's God's will that we love other people, he wants to make sure we understand what love is. 
Because the big issue in our day is like what love is meant to be. Some say that love is, is a warm, fuzzy feeling, right? Some say it's culturally defined, and that means it's always moving and shifting. But Paul gives us three points to help us consider whether we're loving as God would have us love. And he moves through these pretty quickly. First, he tells us that love is defined by what God has taught. That love is defined by what God has taught. Notice, emphasizes that you have been taught by God to love one another. That he's not simply referencing here, I think, in the Old Testament, where God says, love your neighbor as yourselves, but even referencing the command of Jesus to love as he loved. Over and over again, in John 13 to 17, right before he was to be crucified, Jesus said to love one another as he loved. Look, for example, John 13, 35, or 34, look at this. A new command I give to you, that you love one another. That's not the new part. Here's the new part. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. To love as Jesus loved in sacrifice and in service. Consider 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Paul says this, let all that you do be done in love. All things. We have been taught by God how to love because he's given us his word and he's given us Jesus as an example of how to love. So many folks talk about it, but Jesus showed us how to love. Second, he says love is defined by serving others. Love is defined, second, <coughs> by serving others. He provides example of their love by the way they served the brothers throughout Macedonia. They were loving Christians in nearby regions, likely through sacrificial giving and service. Maybe they went and did a, a sort of short-term mission trip to the folks in Macedonia. And so often, what we talk about when we talk about love is we really want to talk about ourselves. People put a ton of emphasis. They go, well, love your neighbor as yourself. That begins with me loving self. And as good as that sounds, love is about service. And it needs another person outside of you to be fully completed and defined. Love is defined by serving others. And third, we see that he says that love is worth excelling in. That love is worth excelling in. Look at the end of verse 10. Look what he says there. He says, we urge you, brothers, to do this, to love more and more, to keep on excelling in your love. Keep doing it. Keep going. If you want something to continue working on, he says, work on your love. Now, there's never a time when God's will is that you don't love someone as he's defined it. So let's go back to the boxes. God doesn't tell us everything that's going to happen in our life, but he does say that Regardless of what happens, we're going to live and walk and do all things in love. So is there a time in our life when it's God's will that we, for, that we not forgive somebody who's hurt us? He would say, no, that, that his will is that we forgive them, that we not seek revenge. That his will is that we support our brothers and sisters through prayer, through financial support, or through simple words. God's will is that we excel in love. And Paul closes with one connected point here that's, that's incredible. Look at this. Finally, we're to consider God's will for your work. God's will for your work. He tells the Thessalonians that one of the most loving things they can do is get a job. I love this. In, in the context talking about loving other people, look at verse 11. He says, And aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your own hands, as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is awesome. Paul says that work is important. And he's going to give us three reasons why it's God's will that you work. But let me say this. He doesn't simply mean a nine to five, though it's part of it. So mothers who stay at home with the kids, friends, you work, and you work hard. 
Some of us, maybe you're retired or you're starting to sort of slow down. Even hobbies that you do, things you do to encourage other people, hobbies you do, ways you serve your kids or grandkids, that goes under this sort of broad umbrella of work. Work is far more than simply a paycheck, right? And here's what he says. He, this is why he says work is so important. He says, first, that work is valuable because it allows us to live quietly. Work is valuable because by it, we can live quietly. When we're busy with work, we don't feel the need to give our opinions on everything or to be involved in everything. Here's the most important thing you can realize. Your work is more important than your opinion. Your work will always be more important than your opinion. Here's what Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, said. This is one of my favorite things. Everybody said he said, a dairy maid can milk cows for the glory of God. I love it. Because he says, hey, so many people think, well, the only people who can really glorify God, they've got to be a, a pastor or a missionary. He says, no, 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 no. The dairy maid milking the cows out in the heat, that glorifies God. Martin Luther also said, he talked about the Christian shoemaker. He said, what makes the shoemaker a Christian shoemaker? He said, not that they put John 3.16 on the bottom of the soles, but that they make really good shoes in service to God and in service to others. So hear me here. Teachers, you do a good work that God is pleased with if you do it for God and in service to the kids that you, that, you, that, that you serve. Medical professionals, you serve God by serving others. Mothers, you do one of the most important jobs in the world. Self-employed, plumbers, contractors, you do valuable, skilled labor because God is glorified in your ordinary, everyday work. Serving your local community through needs, through hard work, and in service to others. Therefore, he says, get to work and live an honest and quiet life in service to God and not to win the ears of the world. He says, second, that work is valuable so that we can stay to ourselves. Work is valuable because we can say to ourselves, I love this, he says, mind your own affairs. In other words, work keeps you out of other people's business. I love it. And he actually is going to talk about this more in his second letter, that there were people among them who were busy bodies, not busy at work. And friends, this isn't just a, a 21st century problem. It was a first century problem because human nature has never changed, but our access to other people's business certainly has. And he says this, if you are always in drama and conflict, God's word for you is to get a job, get a hobby, something. Just stay out of other people's business. Work is a valuable thing because it keeps us to ourselves. And finally, he says, work is valuable because it is a good witness. Look at verse 12. Work is a good witness. Look here at verse 12. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Here's, here's what he said. He says, not working and being constantly dependent on others and on their charity, he says, is not a good witness. Being independent as much as possible is God's will for your life. So we can go back to the boxes again. Is it God's will that we ever just simply mooch off of other people's kindness? No. Right? Because God says, hey, that work is good. Is it God's will that we just sit at home and do nothing? No, it's not. Sure, we could retire from a job and spend more time at home in service to others, but he never wants us to simply turn off and do nothing until the day he takes us home. God may not tell you exactly what job you're meant to do. By the way, I hate that. Well, I just haven't found what I meant to do, so I'm going to do nothing. <laughs> no, 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 no. God is saying that when you work quietly and faithfully and consistently, you are doing what God wants you to do. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. That quiet, faithful, consistent work, that's 
what God wants you to do. Some of us are waiting for God to write a career in the clouds when all he wants us to do is to work doing something we love with the gifts we have and to see that God's going to bring us where he wants us over time. So let me, have, let me have two words of application. We're almost done. I know this was a lot to sort of soak in, but you know this, so often we're worried about where we're going to end up rather than where we are. So often we, thinking about the future is not a bad thing, but so often we're so worried about what God would have for us in the future. We are worried about the now because God's future to us is often a mystery, at least at moments. Right? There's one theologian, I love this, he said that providence, which is God's plan, right? that God's plan for your life is like a Hebrew word, best read backwards. You know, in, in English we read left to right, Hebrew they read right to left. And he said sometimes you've got to get to the end of your life to look back and see all that God was doing. And so here's an important principle especially for those of you who may be consumed with the future today. Look at this. This is in your notes. Do in the present what God has revealed in his word, and he will bring you to what he hasn't revealed for your future. Do in the present what God has revealed in his word, and he will bring you to what he hasn't revealed for your future. And friends, as we are seeking God's will here, there, there's something many of us likely miss in the very first Verses, something to unlock how to walk in this way. Because the message, I hope you never walk away, but the message is do better. Or step up. Or live better. Because, friends, moralism never saved anybody. But rather, I want you to notice verse 8 again. He says, therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. God has given us his spirit to indwell us for this life. He brings us this command, we're told, in and through Jesus Christ. In other words, none of this is possible without the gospel. Without Jesus living God's will perfectly in his life and ministry, we would have no hope. Without Jesus dying on the cross to forgive us for the times we live like the Gentiles, we would have no hope. And without the resurrection, we wouldn't have the promise of the Spirit because the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us and enables us to live this way. Here's the final thing I'll say in this in your notes. God's will is that you would know Jesus by grace through faith, experience salvation, and walk in the of the Holy Spirit. This is the promise of the gospel, to be received by grace through faith, the Spirit of God empowering us to live the will of God, for him to raise us from spiritual death to spiritual life and help us walk a new path in honor and glory, a path of purity, a path of love, and a path of work, a path that is difficult and full of sacrifice, yes, but a path that ends with God. Are you walking in the will of God this morning? Or are we so consumed with things that aren't our business, that are God's secret and mysterious ways, that we're allowing that to cripple us from doing what God has revealed and commanded? Friends, you don't have to know what, what, what you're supposed to do with your life to know what God wants you to do. It begins by taking a step of faith, calling upon the name of the Lord, and he'll meet you right where you are and fill you with his spirit. It means knowing and loving his word, what he's revealed to us and to our children that we might do these things. It means relying on the spirit and the wisdom of older and godly brothers and sisters to help guide our way. And it means trusting that God's secret will that we're often so worried about is actually far greater than anything we could ask or imagine. So this morning, I would ask us to consider, are we walking in God's will? What do we need to repent of and, and give before him? What promise do we need to lay claim to it and walk in his power? And are we so concerned with what God hasn't said that we're crippled to not do what God has said? 
Help us to consider that and to respond in worship to Him, whether that's through repenting and placing our sins before Him, whether that's calling on Jesus for the first time and walking in this will as He would have us do, whatever it is. Now is the time to respond in faith to our Savior. Let's stand and let's pray together. Father in heaven, you're good, and we're thankful that you're good. Thank you for the way that you love us and give us a good hope through grace. Thank you for the way that you have told us and not left us completely in the dark as to your will and to your way. We ask that you would be honored and glorified in our worship. Have us to respond as you would have us to, as you have revealed to us. Lord, may we step forward in faith, knowing that you are with us, your spirit is in us and guiding us. Help us to walk in your will, to please you, and to know that we can please you. You're not a, a father distant and displeased with us. We're, we're not, if we're in Jesus, we're not disappointments to you. But you love us. You've given us his righteousness to walk in. And we ask that you be honored in all that's said and done. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.